When we last left off in the Tale of Despero, we learned that our friend Miggery So was being transported to go live in the castle as a servant because when one of the soldiers went to the houses in the Kingdom of Dor to collect all of the soup spoons, bowls, and kettles, he discovered that Uncle owned somebody and that was not allowed. That's against the law. So the soldier made uncle hand over Miggery So and the soldier is taking Mig to go live in the castle. And she's super excited because that's where the itty bitty princess lives that she saw on her seventh birthday all those years ago. And she too wants to be a princess. So she's thinking this is where it's going to start. I'm going to be a princess. Chapter 29. Start with the curtsy and finish with the thread. Miggery So's luck continued. On her first day on the job as a castle servant, she was sent to deliver a spool of red thread to the princess. On her first day, she gets to go meet the princess. Mind, said the head of the serving staff, a door woman named Louise. She is royalty, so you must make sure you curtsy. What? shouted Mig. You must curtsy, shouted Louise. Gore, said Mig. Yes, ma'am. She took the spool of thread from Louise and made her way up the golden stairs to the princess's room, talking to herself as she went. Here I am, off to see the princess, me, Miggery So, seeing the princess up close and personal like. And first off, I must curtsy because she's royalty. At the door to the princess's room, Meg had a sudden crisis of confidence. She stood a moment clutching the spool of red thread and muttering to herself. Now, how did that go? Give the princess the thread and then give her a curtsy? No, 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 the curtsy first, then the thread. That's it, gore. That's right, that's the order. Start with the curtsy and then finish with the thread. She knocked at the princess's door. Enter, said the pea. Mig, hearing nothing, remember her ears are all messed up, knocked again. Enter, said the pea. And Mig, still hearing nothing, knocked yet again. Maybe, she said to herself, the princess ain't home. But then the door was flung wide open and there was the princess herself staring right at Miggery So. Gore, she said as her mouth was hanging open. Hello, said P. Are you the nurse serving maid? Have you brought me my thread? Curtsy, I must, shouted Mig. She gathered her skirts, dropped the spool of thread, stuck out a foot, stepped on the spool, rocked back and forth for what seemed quite a long time, and finally fell to the floor with a Miggish thud. Whoopsie, said Miggery So. The pea could not help it. She laughed. That's all right, she said to Mig, shaking her head. It's the spirit of the thing that counts. What? shouted Mig. It's the spirit of the thing that counts, shouted Pea. Thank you, miss, said Mig. She got slowly to her feet. She looked at the princess and looked down at the floor. First the curtsy, then the thread, Mig muttered. Pardon, said the pea. Gore, said Mig, the thread. She dropped to her hands and knees to locate the spool of thread. When she found it, she stood back up and offered it to Pea. I brought you your thread, didn't I? So there's Meg falling over on the piece of thread on the spool of thread when she was trying to do her curtsy. She's not very graceful, is she? Lovely, said the princess as she took the thread from Meg. Thank you so much. I cannot seem to hold on a spool of red thread. Everyone I have disappears somehow. Are you making a thing? asked Meg, squinting at the cloth and piece hand. I'm making a history of the world, said the pea, in tapestry. See? Here is my father, the king, and he is playing guitar because that is something he loves to do and he does quite well. And here is my mother, the queen. She is eating soup because she loves soup. Soup, gore, that's against the law. Yes, yeah, said the princess. My father outlawed it because my mother died while she was eating it. Your ma's dead? Yes, yeah, said the pea. She died just last month. She bit her bottom lip to keep her from trembling. Ain't that the thing, said Mig. My ma's dead too. How old were you when she died? Bold was I, said Meg, taking a step back from the princess. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. How old? How old were you? shouted the pea. Not but six, said Meg. I'm sorry, said the princess. She gave Meg a quick, deep whoop of sympathy. How old are you now? Twelve years. So am I, said the princess. We're the same age. What's your name? she shouted. Miggery. Miggery so, but most just calls me Meg. And I saw you once before, princess. You passed me by on a little white horse on my birthday. I was in the field with Uncle Sheep and it was sunset time. Did I wave to you? So asked the princess. Eh? Did I wave? shouted the princess. Yes, nodded Mig. 
But you didn't wave back, said the princess. I did, said Meg, only you didn't see. Someday I will sit on a little white horse and wear a crown and wave. Someday, said Meg, and she put her hand up to touch her left ear. And I will be a princess too. Really, said the pig, the pea. And she gave Meg another quick, deep look, but said nothing else. When Meg finally made her way back down the golden stairs, Louise was waiting for her. How long, she roared, did it take you to deliver a spool of thread to the princess? Too long, guessed Meg. That's right, said Louise, and she gave Meg a good clout to the ear. Another person giving her clouts to the ear? Meg can't catch a break. You are not destined to be one of our star servants. That is abundantly clear. No, ma'am, said Meg. That's all right, though, because I aim to be a princess. You, a princess? Don't make me laugh. This reader was a little joke on Louise's part, as she was not a person who laughed, ever. Not even a notion as ridiculous as Miggery So becoming a princess made Louise laugh. Chapter 30, To the Dungeon. We're going back to the dungeon. At the castle, for the first time in her young life, Mig had enough to eat. And eat she did. She quickly became plump and then plumper still. She grew rounder and rounder and bigger and bigger. Only her head stayed small. Reader, as a teller of this tale, it's my duty from time to time to utter some hard and rather disagreeable truths. In the spirit of honesty, then, I must inform you that Meg was the tiniest bit lazy. And too, she was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. That is, she was a bit slow-witted. Because of these shortcomings, Louise was hard-pressed to find a job that Meg or so could effectively perform. In a quick succession, Meg had failed as a lady-in-waiting, she was caught trying on the gown of a visiting duchess. A seamstress, she sewed the, clo the cloak of a riding master to her own dress and ruined both. As a chambermaid, she sent to clean the room. She stood open-mouthed and delighted, admiring the gold walls and floors of tapestries, exclaiming over and over again, Gore, ain't it pretty? Gore, ain't it something then? And did no cleaning at all. And while Meg was trying and failing at these many domestic chores, other important things were happening in the castle. The rat in the dungeon below was pacing and muttering in the darkness, waiting to take his revenge on the princess. And upstairs in the castle, the princess had met a mouse, and the mouse had fallen in love with her. Will there be consequences? You bet. Just as Meg's inability to perform any job had its consequences. For finally, as a last resort, Louise sent Meg to the kitchen, where Cook had a reputation for dealing effectively with difficult help. In Cook's kitchen, Meg dropped eggshells in the pound cake batter. She scrubbed the kitchen floor with cooking oil instead of the cleaner. She sneezed directly onto the king's pork chop moments before it was going to be served to him. Of all the good-for-nothings I've encountered, shouted Cook, surely you are the worst, the most cauliflower-eared, the most good-for-nothingest. There's only one place left for you. The dungeon. Eh? said Meg, cupping her hand around her ear. You are being sent to the dungeon. You are to take the jailer his noonday meal. That will be your duty from now on. Reader, you know that the mice feared the, the dungeon. Must I tell you that humans feared it too? Certainly, it was never far from their thoughts. In the warm months, a foul odor rose from its dark depths and permeated the whole of the castle. And in the still cold nights of the winter, terrible howls issued from the dark place, as if the castle itself were weeping and moaning. It's only the wind, the people of the castle assured each other. Nothing but the wind. Many a serving girl had been sent to the dungeon, bearing the jailer's meal, only to return white-faced... Weeping hands, teeth trembling, insisting that they would never go back. So here is Cook telling Meguri So that she is destined to work in the dungeon. And worse, there are whispered stories of servant girls who had been given the job of feeding the jailer, who had gone downstairs in the dungeon, and who had never been seen or heard from again. Do you believe that this will be Mig's fate? Gore, I hope not. What kind of story would this be without Mig? Okay, really quick, I want to pause. Can you name three characters who are now in the dungeon? Despero, Roscuro, and Migariso. I wonder what's going to happen. Listen, you cauliflower ear girl, shouted Cook. This is what you do. 
You take the tray of food down into the dungeon and you wait for the old man to eat the food. Then you bring the tray back up. Do you think you can manage that? I reckon so, said Mig. I take the old man the tray. He eats what's on it. Then I bring the tray back up. Empty you would be then. I bring the empty tray back up from the deep downs. That's right, said Cook. Seems simple, don't it? But I'm sure you'll find a way to mess it up. What, said Mig? Nothing, said Cook. Good luck to you. You'll need it. She watched as Meg descended the dungeon stairs. There were the very same stairs, reader, that the mouse, Despero, had been pushed down the day before. Unlike the mouse, however, Meg had a light on the tray with the food. There was a single flickering candle to show her the way to the dungeon. She turned on the, she turned on the stairs and looked back at Cook and smiled. That cauliflower-eared, good-for-nothing girl, said Cook, shaking her head. What's to become of something who goes into the dungeon smiling, I ask of you? Reader, for the answer to the cook's question, you must read on. See you tomorrow.